Hello, my name is Ken Harrell, and I'm the head of the Workers' Compensation Department at the Joy Law Firm. I'm very fortunate to have some outstanding lawyers and paralegals who work with me on these cases, and one of those lawyers may be the primary lawyer handling your case. Thank you for choosing our law firm to assist you with your work injury. If you're watching this DVD, I have to assume that you've been hurt while working, because that's a big part of what we do. We represent injured workers. Over the last 40 years, our law firm has represented thousands of injured workers in South Carolina, and I believe you've made an excellent choice by choosing our law firm to assist you. But we know you had a choice, and I want you to know how much we appreciate your having placed your trust in us. The purpose of this DVD is to provide you with an introduction to the law of workers' compensation in South Carolina. The information that will be covered is especially important in light of the changes made to our workers' compensation law by the legislature in July of 2007. Some of these changes will have a drastic effect on the rights of injured workers if they're not aware of what their rights are when it comes to their work injury. Some of you may have had a past claim related to a car accident, and our law firm has also represented thousands of persons who have been hurt in a car accident. If you've had that experience, you need to know that your rights related to a work injury are going to be very different from what they were for your car accident claim. The way the benefits are calculated and the way that the benefits are paid are completely different. I want to begin by giving you some background about the history of our Workers' Compensation Act. Not to bore you with a history lesson, but because without knowing how our act came to be, it's hard to understand why the benefits are structured the way that they are. Years ago, before our Workers' Compensation Act was passed, Recoveries for a work injury and for a car accident injury were pretty much the same. It used to be that if you got hurt on the job, your claim was treated the exact same way that the claim of someone injured in the car accident would be, as far as wherever you could get a recovery and what your rights to a recovery would be. In other words, if you were hurt on the job, you used to have to prove that somebody did something wrong to cause your accident. So if you were injured on the job before the Workers' Compensation Act, you had to prove that your employer or perhaps a co-employee did something wrong and that caused your injury. The problem is that for most injured workers, it's very hard to prove that somebody else did something wrong to cause your injury. We know that it's a fact of life, that people who do physical work, unfortunately, they're going to get hurt from time to time. Before the Workers' Compensation Act, if you were the construction worker who hurt his back and suffered a herniated disc because you picked up something heavy and maybe twisted the wrong way, you would have been out of luck because you could not have proven fault. And your employer basically would have said, look, we're sorry you got hurt, get yourself well, maybe we'll put you back to work. But essentially, you would have been thrown out on the scrap heap at that point, and somebody else would have been brought in to do your job, and the employer would just move on. What the Workers' Compensation Act was designed to do was to cover as many injured employees as possible. It created a no-fault system. And what that means is that you don't have to prove fault now in order to get a recovery. All you have to prove is that you were working when you got hurt. By way of example, if we have a UPS driver who runs for a red light while he or she is working, and as a result of that is badly injured, that employee would still be able to get workers' compensation benefits, even though the accident was their fault, because the only question that you have to answer in the affirmative to get workers' compensation benefits is, was the person working when he or she got hurt? If so, you're entitled to work comp benefits. Now that's the good side of it from the perspective of the employee, the fact that more people are covered than certainly would be the case if we had a fault-based system. But there were some trade-offs, because clearly when they enacted the system over 70 years ago, they were looking for some benefits for the employer and for the insurance company also. When they first passed this law, there was a real outcry, particularly from the insurance companies, because they were saying, good Lord, we're going from a situation where we may have one or two claims a year to where we'll have hundreds or thousands of claims each year because physical workers are going to get hurt. So what were the benefits that the employers and the insurance companies received? Number one, workers' compensation is an exclusive remedy for an employee who is injured on the job. And what that means is that you cannot sue your employer and you cannot sue a co-employee outside of the Workers' Compensation Act, even if you can prove that they did something wrong or even something reckless to cause your injury. You're limited to what you are able to recover under our Workers' Compensation Act, no matter what your employer or your co-employee may have done to cause your accident. The second biggest benefit for the employers and the insurance companies is that there are tight caps on what you can recover for a work injury. There are certain things that you cannot recover for. For example, this is one that comes up all the time. A client will ask me, what about my pain and suffering? 
And unfortunately, the answer is that there is absolutely no recovery for pain and suffering under the Workers' Compensation Act. There's no recovery for what we call intangible damages, things like pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life. Personally, I think that's unfair to injured workers, particularly an injured worker who's had a severe injury and has had to undergo something like a shoulder surgery or a back surgery. Now, if you were injured in a car accident, yes, you'd be able to recover for those types of things. But there's no way that we're going to be able to get your recovery for those elements of damages when it comes to your work injury because it's not allowed. So what you will need to understand at the beginning is that there are limitations and caps on the things that you can recover for. And what I want to do now is go through the basic benefits with you so you'll have a better understanding of what you're entitled to receive due to the fact that you've been injured on the job. Number one, the most important benefit for a work injury in my opinion, and I will talk about it in even more detail later in this DVD, is your medical coverage. You have the right to full and complete medical coverage for your work injury. And unlike a car accident where a lot of times the amount of the recovery is capped based on how much insurance coverage the at-fault driver has in effect, there's no cap on how much medical coverage you're entitled to receive for a work injury. Unfortunately, I have had people who have had catastrophic work injuries like paralysis and their medical costs have gone up into the millions of dollars. But there's no cap that says, okay, you're getting ready to cross over $100,000 in medical bills and that's going to be it. It doesn't work like that when it comes to workers' compensation. Another benefit of our system is that you should not pay one penny for your medical treatment if your claim has been accepted by the workers' compensation insurance company. It's not like the health insurance situation where you may have some copayment obligation or there may be a deductible that you have to pay out of pocket. If you've been injured on the job and your claim's been accepted, workers' compensation is required to pay all of your authorized treatment costs. The doctors who work within our workers' compensation system are required to write off any balance after they have gotten the workers' compensation payment from the insurance company. So they shouldn't be billing you for any balance because that would not be appropriate under our system. Now one thing that can be a problem when it comes to medical coverage for work injuries is that in South Carolina, the work comp insurance company does have the absolute right to choose who your treating physician is going to be. Attorneys like myself who represent injured workers for a living have been fighting for years to try to get that change in South Carolina to at least give injured workers some say-so in who they're going to treat with. Unfortunately, in a state as conservative as South Carolina is, when it comes to workers' rights, we have not been able to get that change made. We almost did in 2006. We actually had a tie vote in the South Carolina House on that issue. But as the law now stands in South Carolina, the insurance company will get to choose your doctor, and in order to ensure that your treatment costs are covered, you need to treat with a doctor who has been chosen by the insurance company. There are a couple other issues related to medical care that I want to touch on. First, mileage reimbursement. You have the right to be reimbursed for your mileage related to your treatment and that includes mileage to and from the drugstore to pick up your prescription drugs. But you need to keep track of your mileage. We will give you some forms that you can use to track your mileage, and you can send those forms to us, and we will submit them for you for reimbursement. When I did this DVD, the mileage reimbursement rate was 44 and a half cents per mile, but certainly over time, I would expect that rate to go up. Also, your prescription drug costs are, of course, covered by workers' compensation. And typically the insurance company will either authorize the prescription drugs at the drugstore or they will give you a drug card that you can use. But if you incur any prescription drug costs, you need to get us those receipts so we can submit those for you and get you reimbursed. The general rule is that any cost to you related to authorized treatment for your work injury, you have the right to be reimbursed for that. Now there are a couple of other issues related to medical care that I think are very important and I will discuss those later in the DVD and why it's so crucial that you hire an experienced attorney to help you with your workers' compensation claim if you have a significant work injury. After medical care, the second basic benefit is your entitlement to get a weekly temporary disability benefits check. If you're out of work due to a work injury, especially if you're at it for any prolonged period of time, this check becomes your paycheck because it's what you are depending on to put food on the table for your family and you. What you will be paid is two-thirds of your average weekly gross wages for the one-year period before the date that you were hurt on. Under South Carolina law, we look at your earnings during the four quarters before the quarter that your work accident occurred in. It's much easier if we have a case where somebody was hurt in January, February, or March, because then we just take their earnings for the preceding calendar year. 
But let's say that someone earned $26,000 during the four quarters before the quarter they were hurt in. We take that amount and divide it by 52 weeks. Or if there's a situation where somebody was out of work for some period of time, we divide it by the actual number of weeks that someone worked. For this example, we end up with a $500 average weekly wage, $26,000 divided by 52 weeks. And if we have someone with a $500 average weekly wage, they would then get two-thirds of that amount $333 for their weekly disability benefits payment. Now why is it that only two-thirds is paid? The reason is that you don't pay any taxes on workers' compensation benefits. So what the legislature was trying to do was to have that payment be fairly close to what your take-home pay would normally be after taxes, Social Security, those types of things are taken out of your pay. Usually that weekly benefit is going to be less than your take-home pay. And I think the reason they did that was to try to give employees the incentive to get back to work as soon as they can. In most cases, the weekly disability benefits will be paid until one of two things happens. First, if the doctor says that you've reached maximum medical improvement, that there's nothing more they can do to get you better. That's a legal basis in South Carolina to cut off those benefits. Second, of course, if you return to work, whether it be on light duty or full duty, that's a basis for cutting off the weekly benefits. You need to be aware that there are different rules after 150 days have passed from the date when you were hurt. During the first 150 days, the insurance company has the right to unilaterally cut off your benefits if they have any reason whatsoever for doing it. After 150 days have passed, then it gets harder to cut those benefits off. And to do it legally, the insurance company needs to either have the injured worker sign a form saying the weekly benefits can be cut off, or the insurance company needs to get an order from the Workers' Compensation Commission saying the benefits can be cut off. Now the third basic benefit that I want to talk about is the recovery for either permanent physical impairment or some form of permanent disability. And this is where the settlement comes into play in a workers' compensation case. One thing you need to understand is that these two concepts, impairment and disability, are very different. Impairment is the effect that an injury has on the functioning of a particular body part. So for example, if I had an injury to my arm, I can end up with perhaps a 20% impairment of the arm. A rating would be assigned by the treating doctor and they have a, a guide that they use to come up with those ratings. But I may not have any disability as a result of that injury. Disability is the effect on an injured worker's ability to either earn a living, to do any gainful employment, or to earn as much money as he or she was making before they got hurt. So again, if I use myself as an example, if I had a 20% impairment in my arm as a result of an accident, I certainly would have little to no disability given my job as a lawyer because this is not a physical job. However, if I was doing construction work, the result of that injury could be some degree of disability because I would not be able to do many of the physical tasks that come into play when you're working in construction. For purposes of this introductory DVD, I want to focus primarily on a recovery for permanent impairment to a body part as opposed to focusing on permanent disability. I would say that in at least 80% of our cases, our clients end up getting a recovery based on some degree of impairment to a body part as opposed to a recovery for some form of disability. Our goal is that you not have a disability case. What we would like to see happen is that you get yourself well, you recover as fully as you can, and then you get back to work. And hopefully you're back to work making the same amount of money, if not more, that you were making at the time that you were hurt. That's in your best long-term interest, and it's in the best long-term interest of your family. Unfortunately, there are cases where people aren't able to do that. Maybe the type of work they were doing is very physical, and there's simply no way they can get back to doing that type of work. And if that's the case, if you have a disability issue, obviously we're going to pursue that claim to try to get the best recovery that we can for you based on your disability status. But if you can get back to work, that's what we would like to see be the end result for you after a work injury. For this introduction, let me address how a recovery for permanent impairment to a particular body part would be calculated under South Carolina law. And this can leave people scratching their heads because the way our system works is that every part of your body has been assigned a value under our Workers' Compensation Act or under the Commission's regulations. So from your pinky finger to your little toe, and for every body part in between, there's a set value in terms of a number of weeks for the body part. 
we have actually had some body parts added with the recent changes to the law in 2007. The shoulder used to be treated as the arm at 220 weeks, and now it's treated as a separate body part worth 300 weeks. The same thing is true for the hip, which used to be treated as the leg at 195 weeks, but now it's treated as a separate body part worth 280 weeks. These were positive changes for the injured workers with the recent change in the law. Here are a couple of examples to give you some idea of how this works. Your pinky finger is valued at 20 weeks of benefits under the Workers' Compensation Act. And so what that would mean if, God forbid, somebody had their pinky finger cut off on the job and they had a compensation rate of $500 a week, what they would get for the loss of that finger would be 20 weeks times $500 or $10,000. Now, nobody in their right mind is going to sell a finger for $10,000 but that would be the recovery for permanent impairment in that example. Now, the back, by way of comparison, is valued at 300 weeks of benefits in most cases. There are some rare situations where the back can be valued at 500 weeks, but in 95% or more back injury cases, the back is valued at 300 weeks. So as another example, let's take somebody who had a back injury and they end up being assigned a 20% impairment of the spine by their treating doctor. The way that we would do that calculation would be to then take 20% of 300 weeks, since the back as a whole is 300, that comes out to 60 weeks. And so again, if we use an example of somebody who has a $500 compensation rate, you would then multiply 60 weeks by $500, and that would result in $30,000 being the base value of that assigned impairment rating. The reason I say base value is that there's a lot of leeway in terms of our ability to be able to negotiate with the insurance company to try to increase the settlement figure for you. You're not stuck with whatever the value of the assigned impairment rating is, particularly the rating assigned by the insurance company's doctor, the doctor the insurance company has chosen. That doesn't mean that that rating value is what you're going to recover. We're able to negotiate that up, and that's one of the things that we do for you as your attorney on these cases. But that just gives you some understanding about how you would calculate the base value of an assigned impairment rating. Now, as far as the disability recovery is concerned, I'm not going to go into great detail for this introductory DVD because most cases aren't going to involve disability. But there are two basic forms of permanent disability. Permanent partial disability occurs where somebody's earning capacity has been reduced, but they're still able to work. Total and permanent disability involves a situation where there's no reasonably stable market for that person's services as far as jobs that are available. You don't have to prove that you're absolutely helpless in order to recover total and permanent disability. Basically, what the commission looks at is, do they feel that there is a reasonable chance that you're going to be able to find employment? The value of a permanent disability claim is going to be significantly higher than the value for recovery for impairment to a body part but it would be premature now for us to go into more detail than that. If there are disability issues in your case, your attorney will discuss that issue with you and explain how a disability recovery would be calculated under our work comp laws. Next, what I would like to address is the question of, why hire a lawyer if you've been injured on the job? Why would it be in your best interest to get an experienced lawyer to help you? Now, of course, every person's situation is different. You may have your own unique reasons about why you decided that you want to have a lawyer help you with your case, but I can go over a few basic things that I see come up over and over again. I think I can address this in an even-handed way because of my background as a lawyer. When I started practicing law, I worked as an insurance defense lawyer for workers' compensation insurance companies, and I can't tell you how many times I saw a situation where an unrepresented worker was dealing with me at a settlement conference or at a hearing and the worker would end up giving up certain rights, often for pennies on the dollar. And I had to bite my tongue because my job at that time was to represent the insurance company's best interests. But I certainly saw a lot of people step on landmines that they didn't know they were stepping on when it occurred. Now, I would be the first to tell you that not every injured worker needs to hire a lawyer. If you don't have an injury that is likely to result in some permanent residual impairment, then you probably don't need a lawyer. But if you have had any sort of significant injury, here are some basic reasons why I believe you're going to be much better off having a good lawyer than trying to resolve a case on your own. First, compensation rate. Your compensation rate is the basis for every monetary benefit that you receive for a work injury. 
whether it be your weekly disability benefit or your recovery at the end of the case for impairment or for disability. Now what most insurance companies will do, they will simply take a 40 hour work week, they will get your hourly wage, they'll do a calculation. You know, 40 hours times your hourly wage. And then they will tell you that that's your average weekly wage and your compensation rate is going to be two thirds of that figure. And in many cases, they fail to look at other factors that are supposed to be considered in figuring out what the compensation rate should be. Things such as overtime. Your overtime wages should definitely be included in your wages calculation. Bonuses that you may be paid. Those are to be included in your compensation rate calculation. And whether you worked more than one job at the time you were hurt. If you had more than one job, then your wages from all of your employers are supposed to be considered to determine what your weekly compensation rate would be. So the first thing that our attorneys are going to focus on in your case is what your compensation rate is. And we're going to look at the factors that I just went through. We'll probably ask you to get us some independent documents of what your wages were, perhaps some W-2s or some paycheck stubs, so we can use those to double check what the insurance company has come up with. The second reason to have an experienced lawyer is to avoid the mistake that many people make of settling their case based solely on the impairment rating which has been assigned by the insurance company's doctor, the doctor who has been chosen by the insurance company. It just doesn't make sense to do this. Use your common sense here. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of fine doctors who are involved in our workers' compensation system. But it's human nature that if a large part of your business as a doctor come from referrals that are made by the workers' compensation insurance companies, you're going to look at where your bread is buttered. And over time, the ratings you assign are going to become more and more conservative because you're going to want to please the insurance companies that are sending you a large part of your business. There are many doctors who are chosen by the insurance companies to treat injured workers for that purpose alone. That is, the insurance company knows that the doctor is going to give a very conservative impairment rating. And unless you're involved in the workers' compensation system on a regular basis, you're not going to have any idea of whether the doctor who's been chosen for you by the insurance company is one of those doctors. That being the case, what we will do in every case is review the impairment rating that's been assigned by the authorized doctor and then make a determination of whether we feel that rating is overly conservative under the American Medical Association's guides. And if it strikes us as being overly conservative, then we're going to set up an independent medical examination for you with a well-respected doctor of our choice, a doctor who has no ties with the insurance company. We're going to send you to a reputable doctor because there are only seven judges who hear these cases in South Carolina. So it's not going to do us any good to send you to someone who does not have good credentials because the commissioners will know who those doctors are. But for your peace of mind and to give us leverage in trying to get you the best recovery we can for permanent impairment, we're going to consider setting up an independent medical examination in every workers' compensation case that we handle. A third reason why a worker with a significant injury should hire a lawyer, and this is an absolute no-brainer, is if you may be disabled from working as a result of your injury. First, no insurance company will ever concede that you are disabled. It will not happen. Second, if you have a disability case, there are issues related to protecting your entitlement to Social Security disability benefits in addition to maximizing your recovery under the Workers' Compensation Act. If you have a situation where you feel like you may possibly be disabled from getting back to work, and if you are contemplating applying for Social Security disability, and there is nothing inconsistent with applying for Social Security disability while you're getting workers' compensation benefits, but if you think that's a possibility in your case, it is crucial that you get an experienced workers' compensation lawyer because if you don't, what you will end up doing when you settle your workers' compensation case is wiping out tens of thousands of dollars worth of entitlement to Social Security disability benefits based on how you handle the settlement of your workers' comp case. There's a way to avoid that problem because if you have a good lawyer helping you, there is special language that we can put into your workers' compensation settlement agreement that will allow us to protect your Social Security disability benefits to the greatest extent possible. And the same thing is true as far as Medicare coverage is concerned. If you don't settle your workers' compensation case in the right way, you could end up voiding any Medicare coverage that you might otherwise have for your work injuries. So if you've got a disability situation, this is a no-brainer. 
You need to get an experienced lawyer to help you, whether you hire us or somebody else. You need to have someone who knows how to protect your future rights in that situation. The fourth reason to hire a lawyer when you have a serious work injury, and I think for many people this is probably the most important issue that they're worried about, and that's protecting your future medical rights for your work injury to the greatest extent possible. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, because I've been there representing the insurance companies, that the goal of every workers' compensation insurance company is to settle every case using what is called a clincher agreement, which basically is just a full and final release that ends all of your rights for your claim, including your rights to future medical care. To settle the case on that basis, put your file in a box, ship the box off to storage, and to never have to hear from you again when it comes to your claim, including when medical needs arise in the future. But it doesn't have to be that way. Unlike a car accident where you have to sign a release to get any recovery, when it comes to a work injury, there's an alternative way of settling the claim. There's another form that we can use that would at least protect your right to come back to get additional medical coverage after you've gotten your award for permanent impairment or for permanent disability. What we typically tell our clients is that unless the insurance company is going to be paying a premium to settle the case in its entirety, why enter into a clincher agreement if there's an alternative way that might help protect your future medical rights? This issue has become even more complicated with the new law that took effect in July of 2007 because now there really are some booby traps for injured workers. Even if you use this alternative form to the full and final release now, you now have to have specific language in the form that spells out what your future medical rights would be in order to protect yourself. Also, under the revised law, if an employee goes a certain amount of time without getting any medical care now, if there's a lapse in medical treatment, that can be used by the insurance company now to void the employee's future medical rights. So this is an important issue that you would want to have guidance on from a lawyer experienced in our workers' compensation laws to protect yourself. Finally, a final reason for hiring a lawyer that I would note is to help relieve some of the stress that your family and you are going to experience due to your work injury. And trust me, having handled these cases for thousands of injured workers, you're going to be under stress. You have worries about your future, you've got concerns about your family's financial future, and for a lot of these issues, unfortunately, there are not going to be any magic answers that we can give to you. But what we can do, we can provide you with guidance, we can provide you with advice, and we can give you the peace of mind that you're not going to step on some landmine. You're not going to give away rights that you don't have to because you've got somebody who is experienced in the system whose job it is is to protect you to the greatest extent possible that our law will allow. I can assure you that the lawyers and the staff members on this team, we all take that job very seriously. Finally, I want to go over the guarantees that we can give to you about how your case will be handled. And I'm not going to give you some catchy slogan along the lines of one call, that's all, because usually when you hear those kind of slogans, it's all smoke and mirrors. So what are the real promises that we can give to you? One, we will work hard for you. There's no lawyer at this law firm just working a 40-hour work week. We each take our job seriously, we like what we do, and we're here working hard week in and week out to help injured workers get the best recovery that they can. Two, and I think this is probably the most important promise we can give you, we are going to tell you the truth. It may not always be what you want to hear. I wish I could tell you that if you had back surgery due to a work injury, that you're going to get some fair recovery for pain and suffering or loss of enjoyment of life. But unfortunately, you aren't. So there's no reason for me to blow smoke and to tell you something that's not true. I wish I could tell you that the loss of a pinky finger is worth more than a few thousand dollars. But what you need more than anything else is to know that you have a lawyer who's going to give you straightforward advice and you can rely on what we tell you and you can trust us. Those are the only two promises that we will make to you and I think they're the most important ones we can make. Now in return, what we would ask of you is, first, be truthful with us. If you have concerns about some fact in your case, please tell us about it. In many cases, your concern may not have any impact on your claim. But unless you're open and honest with us, we can end up with a situation well into a case where something turns into a much bigger problem than it has to be. Second, 
please keep us regularly updated about the status of your medical treatment. This is crucial. You will be given the name and the direct line telephone number for the paralegal who is assigned to your case. Please make sure you call the paralegal every time after you see a medical doctor. You don't need to call them after physical therapy appointments, but whenever you see a medical doctor, the best way to keep us updated is for you to call the paralegal and let them know what the doctor had to say after every appointment. Third, if you have questions related to your case, pick up the phone and call us. People will often say, I hate to bother you. Your call and your question is not a bother. This is what we do. This is our job. So if you have a question about your case, please call us and let us work for you. Let us help you. In closing, I want to thank you again for giving us an opportunity to help you with your claim. We look forward to working with you and being of service to you. Hopefully, this DVD has helped to answer some of the questions you may have about your rights under the workers' compensation system. If there are other questions you have, please ask us, and we will do our best to address your concerns as best as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you.